So, uh, Mr. Secretary, I, I, I have a, a first question. I'm not sure you've ever been asked, which is you have a PhD in math. Why didn't you become an academic? I started off my PhD program with the intention of becoming an academic. In fact, my whole life is a set of accidents when you think about it. I never really planned what happened to me in my life. It just happened, sort of a random walk process. But about halfway through my PhD program, um, we had our third and fourth children. They were twins. And my GI Bill had run out. And I couldn't live on the salary I was making. So I went to get a part-time job to supplement my research assistantship. And it was with a defense company. I found I liked the job. I found I was good at the job. And so by the time I actually finished my graduate school, I applied both to defense companies for high-tech positions there and to uh, universities. I got offers to start at universities, and I got the tech. And I sort of flipped a coin and took the uh, tech companies that came out. Pro probably what persuaded me was the company that made me the offer. Here I was, was, was in Mountain View, California. And I, wanted, I really wanted to come back and be, be near Stanford. So that helped swing the, and, but the, the real reason was that I, I, I couldn't afford to go on to finish my PhD without getting a part-time job. And that was in defense electronics, and I liked it. And the world's a better place for it. So I'm, I'm glad to hear that story. So uh, when you were 37, you were the head of a lab in a big company, um, but decided to leave and start a startup at the time when there weren't many startups being started. There was no venture capital or barely any. Why did, first of all, what happened in that company that made you kind of like decide to get up and leave? Well, let me set the stage, first of all, for this audience, which, uh, for whom entrepreneurial activity and, and starting a new company is considered the right thing to do. This was back in 1963, before there was a Silicon Valley. It used to be called Santa Clara Valley. Before, when Cupertino, instead of having apple, had apricot orchards. And when Mountain View, instead of having Google, had truck farms. I mean, you, the, the area was so much different then you can hardly imagine it. When you could buy a lovely new four bedroom, two bath house for $25,000. So the world was very, very different then. But in particular, people were not going out and starting companies. The idea of a startup, the idea of uh, a Stanford graduate rushing out and starting up his own company was just unheard of. Everybody worked 10, 15, 20 years in another company, really planned to make their career doing that. So you go back to your question, why did I leave? I had a very good job with a very prompt, very good company. And there were two reasons. I just got annoyed by the administrative apparatus, which is on top of me. The Sylvania, which is the company originally I'd worked for, had been bought by GT&E, which is a big electronics company, a big BMS company. And with that came a whole set of procedures and processes and just pain in the neck as far as I was concerned. Uh, and the second thing that happened about that time was that the, the digital age was starting. To talk to this audience that the digital age is starting would seem hard for them to imagine, but and just to put it in context then, all of the military equipment, those days, 99% of the military equipment, still had vacuum tubes in it. And it was a very, very different world. But the digital age, you could see, was going to change everything. Uh, I wanted to introduce that big time into what I was doing in my laboratory. The parent company, Sylvania, was the world's largest manufacturing of ma vacuum tubes. <laughs> and they understood that semiconductors were going to make a difference. They had a semiconductor laboratory. But it was very clear to me that they could not seize that opportunity. It's what I called then the liability of leadership. If a company has a leadership position in a particular field or a particular technology, and a new disruptive technology comes around, that company almost never is able to seize the new opportunity, even though they see clearly what the opportunity is. It's like they have to kill their own baby and why is to it do that. Existing customers it's psychological. It's psychological. psychological. Yeah. In the leadership of the company. In the leadership of the company. They, they've so, so much invested psychologically and, in, um, and financially also in, the, in their current products. They cannot really grasp the idea of bringing along a new product to kill the one that's been successful for them. So what we, I saw it clearly in Sylvania. Sylvania, although they had a semiconductor laboratory, 
had a head start on all the other companies, were way ahead of Intel. Uh, well, it, uh, who has heard of any of Sylvania semiconductors lately? I mean, they just never made it. Intel took, uh, uh, took the field. The other, another clear example at that time of liability of leadership was IBM. You know, who, who sees the personal computer field? The largest computer company in the world, IBM, or a, an unknown upstart company called Apple. So I think this idea of liability and leadership is very, very important. So, so at that time, you were already... So I saw that liability, and I said, I'm going to get out of here and start my own company. And, 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 but at that time, you just weren't an anonymous engineer. You had a pretty substantial reputation in the intelligence community, and you participated in the Cuban, Cuban Missile Crisis and reviewing intelligence for... I got handed to the president literally that next hour about what was, what was in Cuba. Uh, but it was still an incredibly risky venture. Uh, how'd you fund it? Was there venture capital firms to go to? And it was, I never, you know, I never thought of it as that risky. I had so much self-confidence that we could do it. I suppose that's true of all entrepreneurs. They just believe they can do it. And who's, going to, who's going to stop them from doing it? That's but we, that's but in fact, uh, on your question of venture capital, in those, back in 64 when we started the company, there was very little venture capital in, in the um, most of the venture capital companies you hear of today when he hadn't even been started by that time. There were a few, and we went and talked with one of them. And the media problem was we couldn't tell much about what we were doing. It was all secret work or who our customers were going to be. So that, those discussions didn't go very far, <laughs> which was a good thing because we decided that instead of going to outside for money, we would raise the money ourselves. We would form not as an associate company, that is a company where employees funded the company, but a pure associate's company. All employees had an opportunity to buy stock in the company, nearly all of them, maybe 95% of them exercised that opportunity. Wow. And we sold no stock outside the company as a matter of policy. Wow. In the first year, we raised about a million dollars just from employees of the company, and that was enough to fund the company. Uh, and then our profit company was profitable from the first year, and then the on ongoing profits funded the, the later growth. But it was a... It was, a, it was a situation which is uh, hard to relate to today. The point, the main point though, Steve, why this turned out to be such an important decision, even more than I realized at the time, was each of the employees who came to the company, including myself and the other first founders, essentially, none of, them, none of us had any, any wealth, inherited wealth. We had a retirement fund at the company we'd worked for for 10 years. And so we took our retirement funds and invested them in the company. So if the company failed, it was not some poor venture capitalist losing his money. It was each one of the employees' life savings that were out the window. Wow. Now, that was a huge incentive, believe me, a huge, a huge incentive. To get it right. Yeah. And, and when you built the company, there was maybe Fairchild, Hewlett Packard, other technology companies as models. What did you decide to adopt and what did you decide to do different in building a culture? I don't know that we made such a conscious decision of doing that. They, what, we ended up with a very different culture, as right. you know. It was a Google-like culture today, but Google did it consciously with a reason. They thought this was a good way of bringing in and stimulating employees. We stumbled onto it. We stumbled onto it because we were a company owned by its employees. And so the employees had a lot to do and say about how the company was run and managed. And that just led to an environment like a Google-like environment. And give them a couple of examples of what was unique that was different. Do you remember? I, it's hard to point to any one thing, Steve, but it was, I would say it was most of the employees who worked there would say, particularly when I left, they told me there was like a family working here. People felt a bond to each other. It was collegial. And I thought part of that bond, and I think all of it went back to the idea that it was a comp an employee-owned company. It was their company. I have a... Uh, I had a Navy captain who was my military aide when I was the Secretary of Defense. And he later went on to command a ship. And his way of, of commanding that ship, which was quite unmilitary-like, was anybody would come to him and say, here's a problem, what should I do with it? And he said, it's your ship. <laughs> it's your ship. Do what you think would be best if you owned the ship. Well, that was sort of the attitude in the company. It's your company. What's the right thing to do? It's your company. Do the thing which you think is best. Now, you had a view about customers. I remember you transmitted to your employees about how you treated customers and how you thought about them. It's maybe worth sharing with people today who think that customers exist to buy products. 
I, certainly for our company, and I think for probably for most companies, to succeed, the leadership of the company has to identify and associate themselves with the customer's problems and try to, you're there to solve their problems. And if you, if you stay, if you believe that, if you act on that, you end up with a very successful marketing program and a successful company. But you have to believe it. It's not just a matter of saying it. You have to believe it and, and act on it. So for that reason, we ended up with, um, became very dedicated customers who understood that we, that we took their problems very much to heart. And, and they were incredibly loyal to you and, and I they think were. vice versa. Yeah. You were doing things that were normally sometimes the province of the customer and sitting side by side with them. That's we were acting like the customer sometimes, but in the customer's interest. Okay. Um, so back to your days as a land manager inside of, uh, Sylvania and as the CEO of a company working with these customers, how did you sell and convince others that some of the non-consensus ideas that you had for products or ideas made sense when everybody wanted to go down the better version of existing? Do you remember ever having any of those conversations and uh, yes we because um, you were great at it I mean obviously you have a track record of being successful selling disruption basically the technical idea of starting the company was to seize the new products coming out of the digital field the new semiconductors and develop products in our field around those new devices and I was persuaded that it would allow us to make a five to 10 times improvement in the performance of the product wow. at a lower cost. And to the extent that was true, you couldn't lose, of course. And that would turn out to be true with most of our <clears throat> I'll just give you one example, which uh, is easy to understand, I think. We, we had built for Sylvania a direction finding system. This is for airplanes. You put antennas on the airplane, they receive the signal from several different antennas and then compare the wavelength and determine the direction of the signal. And for reconnaissance, that's a very important, you want to locate where the signal is, is located. That was a very important decision. The problem with doing that is that the signal came to the antenna directly and also bounced off the wing, bounced off the fuselage, about, and it came in three or four different signals. And so you had a confusing signal and it ended up introducing substantial errors in your calculation. So we would end up with maybe a, two or three degrees error in, in location because of that problem. And it occurred to us that because we were using digital technology, because we had small computers that could be put right on the airplane, that we could calculate what those errors would be ahead of time, compensate for them, and correct them on the fly. Wow. And by doing that, we made about a factor of 10 improvement and actually went down a few tenths of a degree. Wow. So once we had done that, nobody wanted to buy direction finding system from anybody but us because we were the only ones who could do that at that time. It was, it was a simple idea, really. But it was the fundamental idea was seizing this new technology and say, how can you apply it adaptively to this new problem? It wasn't just a matter of replacing vacuum tubes with semiconductors. It was saying, once you introduce the semiconductors, it's possible to do things you could not have done otherwise. And, and in particular, with a computer that was fast enough, the computer that go on an airplane, it was fast enough to make those calculations on the fly was, was, the, was the thing that changed the game. And, and was that the, the, the beginning of the emergence of many computers from HP and others, or was that even before we that? We were using what was then called the HP 2000 computer, which is a dinosaur today. It was, a, it was about that big. Had less power than one of your laptops today, but still, it was a very powerful computer in those days. It was fast enough. It was small enough that you could put on an airplane. It was fast enough to do that job. And did it require for you to have your businesses at ESL to have counterparts in the government to, who actually thought like you? There were a few. And you find them and seek them out and then encourage to give, plant the eyes with these with them and let them sell them up the line. Now that's a big idea for any entrepreneurs in the audience is you find partners at your customer and you let them take credit for, the, for the, what geniuses they were. Um, are there any that you remember in particular who made a difference? I will protect their identity. <laughs> <laughs> and and some, some who are still being talked about 50 years later. Um, and, uh, well, look, 50 years later, some of the work I was doing then, I just had my book published about a year ago. And before I published it, I had to submit it to the Defense Department for review, for classification review. 
they weren't reviewing the content of it, but whether anything I was saying in the classified. They took out five paragraphs of the book, and to my amazement, it had nothing to do with the period when I was Secretary of Defense. It all dealt back in the 1960s, when I was doing the thing I'm talking about now. But five paragraphs, we were saying things about programs we were working on then that they considered still, 50 years later, still classified. Wow. So. And, and why do you think that is? I think it's just bureaucratic laziness. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't get around to declassify. They should have. But also, they were very highly secret in those days, very highly secret. Right. It's a, I, I talk about security in our country like the Hotel California. Once you check in, you can never check out. Um, and, uh, now, you were president of the successful company. It was growing. And, and all of a sudden, you get a call from the US government um, that says, we'd like you to leave Palo Alto and come to Washington, DC. Yeah, yeah. And you did it multiple times. It can't be the pay. What were you thinking? <laughs> well, what I was thinking was, no, I don't want to do that. <laughs> So I got a call from an old friend, his, Harold Brown was his name. He had been the president of Caltech, and then he had gone back to, he was invited by President Carter to become Secretary of Defense. He was a PhD in physics, so a technical background like myself. And uh, he asked me if I'd come back to be his undersecretary for research and engineering. And I said, no. I mean, I wanted, today we talk about entrepreneurs and serial entrepreneurs. People are proud to say they are a serial entrepreneur. I am proud to say I was not a serial entrepreneur. I, my plan was simple and plain. I wanted to take my company and build it into a great company. I had no idea of bouncing off with another idea to another company. Well, that was my plan. And, and, and since I was firm in that plan, the last thing I wanted to do is leave my company and go back to Washington. So I said no. And after two weeks of protracted discussion back and forth across the country, I yielded and said yes. And which, which is the right answer, by the way. But what persuaded me to say yes was, this was 1977 now, and January 1977. And the president and the secretary carefully explained to me that we were in a very serious security issue in those days. I won't bore this class with the whole security issues of 1977, but they had some resemblance to security issues today. But when the World War II ended, we ended up with a, almost a nuclear monopoly, but we disbanded. I, we had an army of 10 million men then. We disbanded the army. We disbanded our defense industry. The Soviet Union, on the, on the other hand, observing what had happened in World War II, decided they would maintain a large army and that they would build up a defense industry. They wanted to emulate what the United States had done in World War II. They thought the reason the Allies had won World War II was because of America's industrial might. That's an oversimplification, but certainly was a major factor. America's industrial might. They said, the next war we want to win with our industrial might. So they tried to emulate what we had done. They built up this huge defense industry and uh, maintained quite a large army. So in 1977, now with all that background, they had an army about three times the size that uh, not just we had, but which the NATO had at that time. Up until that point, we had said, so what? We have a great nuclear advantage. But by 1977, they'd caught up in nuclear weapons as well. Everybody was concerned. There was, there was serious talk, I think greatly overstated talk, about a window of vulnerability to a surprise attack by the Soviet Union. Um, there was a lot of concern in my, to the point of hysteria, I would say. But in any event, the serious concern was we had to do something about that. And the president had decided very clearly he did not want to emulate the Soviet Union into tripling the size of the military. That was huge cost. It would, be, it would bankrupt our economy doing that. Not to mention the fact it would have been very politically un, 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 unpopular. So he said, we're not going to do that. We want to offset their superiority in numbers with a superiority in technology. That's the magic word, offset. Offset. He wanted to offset that. And, and he's seen what I'd done with the company. And he said, what you did was introduce digital technology into your particular field. It was very successful. I want you now to introduce digital technology to all of our to most important military weapons. And, offset, and use them then to make them so much superior to, this, to the Soviet weapons that we will offset their numerical superiority. So we, we, we went then in what came to be called offset strategy number two. The first offset strategy is we use our nuclear weapons to offset them. The second was to use our technology to offset them. So he gave me the job to offset 
And that was a fascinating job. It had about $100 billion a year budget to do that. Kind of like a startup. Which even, and you had to, to multiply that by 10 today to get the equivalent dollars. So it was a lot of money, a lot of resources. And he gave me full authority to do it. Wow. So that was just such a fascinating challenge. Aside from being an important problem, it was a fascinating technical challenge that I couldn't turn it down. So, so I, I want to get into some of the technical challenge, but just for our audience, uh, the chief of the Soviet general staff, uh, after you were done, said about the offset strategy that it was revolutionizing contemporary warfare and posed a military threat that the Red Army couldn't match. We cannot equal the quality of U.S. arms for a generation or two, and we'll never be able to catch up with you in modern arms until we have an economic revolution. And the question is whether we can have an economic re revolution without a political revolution. And I think that answer came about eight years later. Uh, he was right, but I'm surprised he said it. He said it, yeah. and, and, uh, and uh, you know, a lot of people claim, I'm, I'm one of the advocates, is that the second offset strategy bankrupted the Soviet Union because they couldn't follow, and, and the demise of communism was due to William Perry. Um, and the second offset strategy. Um, but, but this really gets back to what you observed when you did ESL, that computers were not just a better version of X, that it was a disruption and a offset about, back then, direction finding and other intelligence systems. And now you had a national stage to kind of play this out on. What technologies did you see and choose and why? And you know, we talk about sensors and stealth and, and precision weapons. Were those already ongoing? Did you select them? How did you invest? What did the status quo think? This must have been a heck of a time. It took, it took, us about, it took me about three months to come up with what the offset strategy would be. I mean, it's one thing to say, we're, we're going to use technology. Three months? But the question is, how? How? How are we going to use it? Well, uh, one of the things we decided right off is we, is we had to make our weapons smart. What do we mean by that? Well, during World War II and during the Korean War, when we dropped bombs or fired artillery shells, we never knew exactly where the target was. And so we had to drop 20 or 30 bombs. And we, and we couldn't guide them accurately. We had to drop 20 or 30 bombs for every target. And so we thought what we wanted was one bomb, one target, which would make a huge difference, not just in the accuracy of our work, but in the logistics tail that was entailed with it. So smart weapons was one part of it. And the technology that was available then led us to, to, to focus primarily on laser-guided bombs. So we built tens of thousands of laser. We developed and then built tens of thousands of laser-guided bombs, which are still today uh, a major fact, component of, of our, our weapons. Uh, we needed to have a way of guiding things accurately, and the laser turned out to, to, to be that. We also had to have a better way of knowing where we were when we fired, if you we were in an airplane. Or so we thought we'd better have a way of accurately positioning. So we just had developed a global positioning system, um, which is what we call GPS today. And of course, everybody uses it in the automobile or in the, in the handheld navigator today. At the time, I wasn't thinking about the commercial applications of it, but the military applications of it were very We weren't thinking obvious. about Yelp and GPS. At the so time. we developed GPS at that time. And if, and if you use it in your car today, you have me to thank for that. <laughs> <laughs> we, uh, also developed something called DARPANET, as, um, which later became the internet. Wow. Um, and all of that was pretty straightforward and obvious applications of, of things we were, had been doing. No great leap forward in imagination, just leap forward technically. What was a leap forward in imagination was building an airplane that could not be detected by radars. Airplanes are a key component in military warfare, have been since World War II. And because they're so key, every country has developed systems for shooting them down that involve radars and, and, and missiles to fire at them. So surface-to-air missiles, which are guided by radars. So we wanted to develop an airplane that could not be detected by radars, and therefore they could be not shot down by missiles. And that was, became to be called a stealth. It's not stealthy in the sense you couldn't see it. If, it's, if the F-117, the B-2 flew over and you looked up, it'd be quite obvious to you. But the radars couldn't detect it. And so they had complete impunity at nighttime. They could operate at night without any. Uh, um, so the stealth was, was the third component of the, the um, those are the three major components. We just decided on that in the first three months. Wow. And then pulled out all of our throttles to move forward. I wanted to have them done by the end of the, the I don't want to stay more than one term in government, so I want to have them done in the four year period. Indeed, we had the first stealth airplane flying 
um, just before I left office and four years later, which is pretty unusual. In the, you don't get the paperwork done usually no. for four years in the government. And, and so, but how did the status quo treat these programs? Did you get opposition? <laughs> <laughs> Note the laugh with, 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 with the horror. <laughs> Uh, well, the, 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 there was a mixture of reactions to it. The, uh, the principal opposition, and it was really an organized group, uh, the, uh, which called themselves the, the, I don't know, the Group for Defense Reform or something, that was against introducing technology into the military on the grounds, and they particularly were opposed to things we were doing on the grounds that they would make the weapons too complex for soldiers to use, so complex that it would break down in the field, and that would be too be so complex to be too expensive. In other words, they had uh, the usability, the reliability, and the cost they thought would be all too high, mm -hmm. which is two of some kinds of complexity you introduce in the system. But in fact, if you back in those days, they just introduced something called the HP 35, which is a Hewlett Packard handheld calculator which is about the size of your iPhone today, small iPhone. And that machine did all of the calculations that the disk calculator did, and a lot more for less cost. It was co less costly, it was more reliable, and it was easier to operate. So all of the things that they were, they were bringing up against it were just in the opposite direction. They mistook complexity for new technology. So the new technology actually was cheaper, simpler, to, easier to operate and more reliable, much, much more reliable than, than the old technology had been. And was the opposition in the military itself or in Congress or uh, the military, contractors? The military was mixed, but it was, there was a lot of people in the military who were hoping we were right and were willing to go along with it. Most of the opposition came from outside the military. It was, it was very, um, it, it really stayed with us for about 10 years until Desert Storm. The first test of this new technology came in 1989, I guess it was, almost 10 years later after we de developed all this stuff. In Desert Storm, the uh, F-117 flew over Baghdad a thousand times, I mean a thousand sorties over Baghdad. <clears throat> Baghdad at that time was the most heavily defended city in the world. They had hundreds of modern Soviet-built surface air missiles. And in those thousand sorties, there wasn't a single airplane shot down. Not wow. one. Not one. They flew them all at night, as they should have done. And, they, and there were thousands and thousands of rounds fired at them, and they never hit a one. So a thousand missions and no airplanes shot down. So the, the stealth worked like a charm. They carried laser-guided bombs, as we talked about here. And 2,000, those 1,000 air sorties dropped 2,000 bombs. 80% of them made direct hits on the target, which again was an unprecedented um, level of accuracy. From that point on, nobody in the military doubted the effectiveness of it. And the critics who just sort of disappeared, they stopped talking. That was a, it was a, a rare opportunity to prove, an op to prove a new technology in such, an, in such a dramatic setting. That's, you know, if the story ended there, that would be an incredible life. But you had a, almost a second career in diplomacy, which is the opposite of preparing for wars, actually waging peace. And you did a, 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 a just an amazing story there. But before I get off on, on diplomacy, I did want to ask you a question. Is we were talking earlier, uh, before we came on, about there's now a search for a third offset strategy. And, and, and maybe we could talk about that for a minute or two, and then we talk about diplomacy. Why are people searching for, or why is the U.S. government searching for third offset strategy? And well, going back to Desert Storm, it was, uh, we were facing really the fifth largest army in the world, 4,000 miles away from our home bases. And they were defeated, they were routed in five days. Wow. And that made a huge impression, profound impression on militaries all over the world. So all of the other militaries said, what can we do about that? And there are two obvious choices. One of them is we try to emulate it, which is not so easy if you don't have the technology base in the first place. Or we can try to work around it. Work around it means we invent something called asymmetric warfare. And the nations that were the smartest 
the adversaries of the Spars went to ad, asymmetrical warfare. And Can you give us an example of asymmetry in war? Yeah, urban guerrilla warfare. None of the things I've talked about, none of the technologies I've talked about have any relevance to that. So why should they fight us in things we're good at, fight in things we're not good at? Ah. The intelligence systems don't work in an, in an urban guerrilla setting. The intelligence is in the, to the benefit of the guerrilla, not to, not to the other way around. So that was the way around. So we, I think, became overconfident. We thought this, because we had this capability for defeating an army in the field, we could do, our military could do anything it wanted to. And so the second Iraq war came, and we had our head handed to us, in my opinion. And we quickly defeated the Iraqi army the second time around, just like the first time around. But that turned out that wasn't the real war. The real war ended up being fought in the cities. It was an urban guerrilla warfare. And we did very poorly in that. So <clears throat> began to dawn on people that the military has to be tailored to deal with what the threat actually is, not what we would like it to be. And that the military we had designed to fight a tank warfare in the desert wasn't, that wasn't the problem that we were going to be facing. And so that led people to think we need a new offset strategy to deal with these new kinds of threats. The new threats are different in nature, they're guerrilla warfare, they're cyber warfare, and there might be conflict in space. You can think of three or four or five possible threats to our military for which the, the, the army we, the military we built isn't, isn't really appropriate. So when the new Secretary of Defense came in a year and a half ago, Ash Carter, who had been, by the way, my assistant secretary when I was Secretary of Defense, and who was very familiar with all this offset strategy stuff. Another PhD in Another physics. PhD, physics, physics in this case. In fact, his PhD was in theoretical physics and Renaissance literature. <laughs> He's a real Renaissance man. So he decided he was going to try to introduce offset strategy three. And it just got started uh, a few months ago. And one of, the, he's been, one of the things he did to realize that, to recognizing the importance of digital technology and information technology to what he wanted to do, was he set up an office out here in Silicon Valley. It's called DIUX, which means what? Defense? Uh, innovation. Innovation experimental. unit. Experimental. experimental yeah. yeah. And, and so do you think he found it? Is there a third offset strategy yet? I don't know. It's a, it's a tough job. It, was, it only took us three months to come up with what we wanted to do in the last time around, but in retrospect, it was a lot easier job than what he's facing now. He, 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 they've been working on this for six months now and have not yet come up with a concrete strategy. Because yet. back then, we had one nation state facing us, which was Soviet the, Union the, with the com was so much conventional different. weapons. And, and it was easier to think of. It was easy to describe. It wasn't so hard to deal with, but it was easy to describe anyway. This one's not quite so. Now we have non-nation states. We have nation states. We have... Yeah. It's, a, it's kind of messier. And in fact, it's a very different problem. He's, and I think a much more difficult problem that he's facing. And technology may, will play an important role in dealing with it, but certainly not the only role. And he's trying to figure out how to tailor the technology to deal with those particular problems. And, That's and what the Offset Strategy 3 is all about. Got it. And so that kind of gets us, it segues into to almost the second career when you were starting your first, and that was diplomacy. And I remember President Carter actually kind of put you on some diplomatic missions at the time um, for diplomatic negotiations with China as well as Israel and Egypt following the Camp David agreements. Um, How did you feel about you know, taking on this expanded role? Did you think of yourself as a negotiator? Did, was there some manual they gave you to, to figure out how to do that? Um, I didn't think there was anything special about negotiating with people, but you had to think of what, what they're trying to achieve, where they're coming from, and listen to them. To learn, to learn that. The, to the extent there's an art in negotiation, it comes not in the brilliant things you say, but in how carefully you listen. And so diplomacy, to me at least, a big part of it is listening to what other people say and trying to figure out how to accommodate them. Can you give me an example? That's an interesting insight. Can you, is there anything you remember that struck you that no one was hearing and you? Well, when I was secretary, um, we had a a tragic situation in Bosnia, where there was a, a, a sort of a civil war going on there between the Bosnian Muslims and the Bosnian Serbs. And 
hundreds of thousands of people being killed and, and millions displaced and put in concentration camps. It was, a, uh, it was the worst atrocity since World War II, really. Mm. And the NATO peacekeeping mission that had been sent in there to deal with it was totally inadequate. They couldn't handle it. So finally, NATO decided to send in the NATO force to bring order to the country and to and to stop the killing and then and get, let the people get back to their homes. And the problem, one of the problems in doing this, with the NATO readily agreed to do that, and the United States was sort of leading the, the mission. But there was, there was Russia. And Russia is a Slavic country, and Serbia is a Slavic country. And they, there's, a, there's a brotherhood relation between them, really. And so they wanted to, they, they were by God send in a brigade also. Well, having a brigade of Russians and a brigade of Americans and a brigade of British under different commands fighting a war seemed like a very a recipe for disaster. That's what we're doing in Syria, by the way, today. But it was in a big, larger scale going on in Bosnia then. So President Clinton and President then Yeltsin agreed that we would have a unified force. They didn't know how to do it, but they said, we ought to have one. And they turned to their defense minister, my, 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 myself in the case of Clinton, and, and, about, and Minister Gorchov in the case of Russia, and said, solve this problem. Find a way of bringing these forces under one command. And so that was my, my greatest exercise in negotiation, I think. <laughs> how do you solve the problem? Because I heard, I, the word that I heard most during those negotiations was niet, niet <laughs> over and over again. And it took us four meetings, really, over a period of two months. We had two months to solve it. And I met once in Geneva, once in Washington, once in Whiteman Air Force Base, and then finally and once in Brussels. So in the, finally, the, the third, third meeting, we got a formula for solution. In the fourth meeting, we signed it. But it was a question of listening to what was really bugging uh, Gorchov, why he didn't want to do that. We finally ended up, he put his brigade, one of his best brigades, reporting to an American division commander. Wow. A brigade in our, one of our divisions. He did not want to report to NATO, but he was willing to have a report to an American commander. Wow. And it took me a while to, you know, I'm a slow learner. It took me three meetings before I figured that out. That's what was really bugging him. Wow. When we finally got a solution to it. But it's listening to the other people. Well, and that segues me into something you said in your book which I, about Russia, which I thought was just uh, a little sobering. If I got it right, you said that in less than 15 years, the relationship between the U.S. and Russia went from being quite positive to an all-time low. And you listed a series of policy decisions that we've made that you believe contributed to the deterioration of relationships. Uh, and I won't list them all, but what do you think we should be doing? Is, it, is there anything solvable with Putin, or is it is some of it on us? Or? There, are, there are many significant problems we're facing today that seem to be getting worse on a month-by-month -month basis. <clears throat> and I, I don't think we can solve any one of those problems but just by attacking that problem. We have to get at the underlying issue, which is the hostility between the United States and Russia today. I think nothing can be solved without addressing that problem directly. And that has to be done at the highest level. It has to be present to present to deal with that. And that's not happening. It's not likely to happen uh, in the near future because based on their experiences with each other, President Putin and President Obama do not like each other at all. Uh, to say they hate each other may be too strong. They hate to be in the same room with each other. It's, it's a bad situation. And I think each of them ought to be able to sort of get over that and work for the common interest. But that may or may not happen. Um, what I and several others, and Senator Nunn have proposed, is that we at least go to Russia with the proposal that we form a working team, high-level working team, to deal with the problem of nuclear terrorism, which is a, equally a danger to Russia as it is to the United States, and find a way of working together on that one problem. If we can do that, if we can succeed on that one problem, then maybe we can work off for a broader, broader base of cooperation. So for the President's job is to define those areas where we can cooperate and try to make that cooperation happen, identify the other problems where we have completely hostile and not going to cooperate, 
and sort of isolate that from them, minimize the danger from, the, from, from those. That's an interesting way to think. I, I just got smarter right there. But find the areas of common interest there must be between nation states. Oh, certainly, certainly the, the, the nuclear, danger of nuclear terrorism. And I want to... A nuclear bomb is likely to go off in, Mos in Moscow as it is in Washington. And I do want to spend time on that, but, but let's just take what you said about Russia, finding common interest. Is the same true for China? Our relationships have deteriorated and we need to find some common interest, or is there different issues going on there? Ask me that again. Are there different issues that are going on with China than there are with Russia? I oh, yes. Um, a huge difference between the U.S. China versus U.S. Russia is we have a, a very profound economic relationship with China, huge trade, bilateral trade with, with China, exchange of technology. There are many, many common interests we have with China. Every reason, every objective reason said that the United States and China ought to be working together on a friendly basis in cooperation to advance the common interests of both countries. And to a large degree, that has been happening. But there have been notable exceptions in the last few years, which worry me a lot. Which ones are those? Well, the most obvious ones are the, uh, okay. no. back up a little bit. There were, was earlier a major problem over Taiwan. And we worked very hard, I think. I worked when I was in office. I worked when I was out of office. And the presidents have worked very hard to resolve that problem. And I think today, Taiwan has gone away as an issue between the United States and China. That it's very unlikely that there would be a war between China and Taiwan that might drag the United States into it. And the, that's a separate issue, and I don't want to discuss it right now, but good things have been done in that area to, to, eat, to, to mitigate that problem, I think. Um, but more recently, the problems have come up in the South China Sea. And there's a clearly, cl clear difference of perception between the United States and China about what the South China Sea is. We look at it as international waters where our ships can pass freely, and some in China regard it as sort of a Chinese lake, and, in, and that they have uh, rights to, and have rights to keep American ships, American planes out of, so on. The differences are very great, not just with the United States, but with the Philippines and with uh, Vietnam, um, Taiwan, all of those countries, but particularly the Philippines, I think, and, and, um, and Vietnam have major disputes with China over the rights of violence, rights on the, on the, you know, in the South China Sea with respect to ownership of islands, with respect to right, drilling rights and so on. So th there have big, been disputes for maybe a decade between Vietnam and China and between Philippines and China. The United States was staying off the side and saying, look, all we care about is we, don't, we want these issues to be resolved peaceably and we want to maintain sailing rights steaming rights through the, through the South China Sea. Uh, this has been being brought to a head, though, by the Chinese starting to build air bases on some of those, or on making a reef and building an artificial island, putting an air base on it. And, and that's leading, I, th I think, to some kind of a showdown, which I'm very concerned about. And, and do, you, do you think China is looking for a showdown, or doesn't think they'll get one? It, it doesn't make sense. I mean, it, 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 it doesn't make sense, but I, don't, I have to say I fully, do not fully understand what's behind uh, the new Chinese president, who uh, is a very different, very different leader than, than the, his predecessors have been, all the way, going all the way back to... Uh, to Deng? Well, since uh, 19, I'd say 83, 84, all the leadership has been working towards a cooperation with the United States and not making waves on territorial issues. But I don't know. I, I just don't know. I can't, say, can't really say where this new leader is headed. But it would be a huge mistake, it would be a tragic mistake, if the United States and China were to get in some sort of a military conflict over, the, over these relatively minor issues on, on ownership of who owns this reef and who owns that reef. But they seem to be symbolic of something They're bigger, symbolic. Of something bigger for China. They're certainly symbolic. And the underlying symbolic issue with China, I think, I think has been their righteous grievance over the um, abuse they took um, for 100 years by Western powers, mostly non, not the United States, but mostly European powers. Um, and they call it a century of humiliation. 
that's a, that's a serious issue in China, and it's one which they have, a right, as I said, a righteous grievance. But now they bring that forward into the modern day. Uh, the thinking forward into the modern day, I think, is, could lead to mischief. And, and, and then let me segue from China a bit to something else you were personally and deeply involved with, which was North Korea. Um, in fact, if I remember, uh, you stated we were this close to having an agreement in 2000, and then five years later, we were facing a nuclear-armed North Korea because of some policy decisions that had been made on someone else's watch. Um, are you optimistic or pessimistic or I'm, scared? I'm, 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 pessi I'm pessimistic right now. How do you think that's going to end up? Yeah. We had, we've had problems with North Korea many times in the last 30 years all over their aspirations to have nuclear weapons. And up, up until the year 2000, we were able to hold off those aspirations. Um, and I went to uh, Pyongyang and met with the leadership in North Korea at the, re at the request of President Clinton in 1999, I guess it was. I was out of office by the time, but he asked me to go over as his personal envoy to deal with North Koreans. And I made a proposal to them whereby the United States would recognize them as a full country. We do not have, we don't recognize them today. We don't have an embassy in their country, for example. Would recognize them, would give them uh, technical assistance. Um, got both South Korea and Japan to give them economic assistance. And in return, they would give up their nuclear weapon program and long-range missile program. And we were very close to a deal, I think. Uh, President Clinton was ready to sign a deal. He sent a, they sent a, the senior military person over to meet in Washington, said they were ready to sign a deal. And a funny thing happened, there was an election and a new administration came in in 2000. The election was 2000, new administration came in January 2001. I was not too much concerned. I'm sorry that we hadn't gotten it done ahead of time before the election, but it, we didn't. And I talked with Colin Powell, who was the incoming Secretary of State. He said, not to worry, we'll, we'll bring this deal to, to conclusion. And two months later, the South Korean president came back to meet with President Bush, and President Bush said, we're cutting off all discussion with North Korea. Uh, wow. And uh, for two years, there was no contact at all. Next thing we knew, they were starting to build nuclear weapons. That's a, I've oversimplified a complicated story, but that, 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 I think we made a major misstep there. I think we could have stopped the program. Now I don't see any good way of stopping it. They have uh, a dozen or maybe more nuclear weapons. They're building more fissile material. They're testing long-range missiles. They're testing submarine missiles. So I think we, we let ourselves in for a serious, unnecessary problem. And do you think they might be a proliferator as well? They what? Do you think they might be proliferating nuclear weapons? Um, they're certainly a proliferator. There's been two ways between them and Pakistan. Some of their technology came from Pakistan, and they have also assisted Pakistan. They sold a nuclear reactor to Libya, and pardon me, to Syria, I mean, to Syria, which the Israelis obliged the, Syria, the Libyans by by uh, the Syrians by bombing, so it doesn't exist anymore. But it came from North Korea. Really? Yeah, which was uh, uh, not, not legal, really. Well, uh, on that high note, <laughs> you and George Schultz and Henry Kissinger and Sam Nunn are still working uh, to reduce the nuclear threat. Um, can you tell us about um, why you're doing that and, and what you want to see happen? In 2006, October 2006, <clears throat> was the 20th anniversary of the Reykjavik summit. Some of you may have never heard of the Reykjavik summit. But in one of President Reagan's, I think, most brilliant diplomatic strokes, he met with the then President Gorbachev of Russia at a, the Iceland capital of Reykjavik. And they talked for two days without notes, without aides, except Secretary Schultz was there about the idea of giving up nuclear weapons altogether. It was a unique and unprecedented event. Well, that was a In the end, they could not come to an agreement. But they talked about it. But they could not come to an agreement. And just 20 years before the anniversary of that, George Shultz said, why don't we have a Stanford conference 
seminar, it wasn't a conference, on the Reykjavik summit, revisited it 20 years later. What were the lessons from the Reykjavik summit? And so we did in 2006. And the conclusion of that seminar at Stanford was that we ought to revisit the idea of eliminating nuclear weapons. And Schultz and Sam Nunn, who was there myself, and then we later got Henry Kissinger to join us, banded up to write an op-ed for the Wall Street Journal, which said just that. Number one, nuclear weapons today are more of a danger than they are an aid to security. And number two, there'll always be a danger until we find a way to eliminate them. And in the meantime, we ought to find ways of reducing their danger. That was the essence of the op-ed. And it caused quite a stir, not because the ideas were so new, but because the ideas were coming from four people who were certified cold warriors. I mean, I'd helped build up this nuclear arsenal, as had Schultz, and as had none in his role as head of the Senate Armed Services Committee, and as Kissinger as Secretary of State. So, so you were now a bunch of radicals. So this was a dramatic statement coming from these four people. It caused quite a stir in the uh, international community. It, and it actually caused some progress along that line for a number of years. The most dramatic progress came when President Obama was elected in 2008, because just two months after he was inaugurated, he went to Prague and gave his first international speech as a president, which, among other things, he said, I state with conviction the intention of the United States to, to seek, to seek and the peace and security of a world without nuclear weapons. It's a stunning statement coming from a president of the United States, and it stunned the world. And for a couple of years after that, we actually made progress in that direction. We had a, made another arms treaty with the Russians, where we each agreed to reduce nuclear weapons. Uh, I think one of the most important things the president did is he started something called the Nuclear Summits, where the 50 nations that have fissile material, fissile material is what it takes to make a nuclear weapon, but it's also used to run nuclear reactors. 50 nations had that fissile material, came together and found, agreed on improved ways of controlling the, that fissile material so it could not fall into the hands of a terrorist. So for about, I'd say four or five years, a lot of good progress made. Now there's been a retrogression. The retrogression, I think, sinks almost completely with the growing hostility between the US and Russia. Okay. Of course, Russia then said, I, we don't want to have any more arms treaty. We don't want any more arms negotiations with the United States. And they started building a whole new round of nuclear weapons. The United States now decides we need to build a whole new round of nuclear weapons. So we have the Cold War and nuclear arms race starting all over again. So we're moving backwards now. Well, on that cheery note. Uh, <laughs> but, but before we take some questions from the audience, the last question for you is, what role can Stanford students, entrepreneurs, play in solving national security problems, engineering or policy problems? What, what can students do? <clears throat> in the case of my example, I didn't even start addressing these problems for twice, 20 or so years into my career. But what I'd done in my career, which is a technical career, turned out to be a huge, a hugely important background for what I ended up doing. So even if you have this aspiration, you don't have to move directly to it. You move to developing your skills so that when you do decide to direct them to security problems or government problems, you have those skills already. But beyond that, if you want to address the issue today, I'd say the first thing you need to do is understand what the issues are. Take the time to study and understand what the issues are. There are many sources available for you to do that, including courses at Stanford. So the first issue is get, get smart on the issues. Then the second, if you've done that, is start to involve other people, your friends, your colleagues, your family, in the issue. Spread the word. Because the reason we are slipping into another Cold War, into another nuclear arms race, is because the people in this country do not understand the dangers of, what, of what, what's underway here. What is, a, what is hap not about to happen, is already in process of happening. And so we have to have a better educated population. So it's, it's 
you have a sort of delayed gratification in saying education, but you have to educate yourself. That's the first step, and you have to help educate others. If we, be, if we become an informed citizenry, then we'll take informed and intelligent actions. We are not today an informed citizenry on this problem. Okay. Well, thank you, Mr. Secretary. Um, what I'd like to do is take uh, at least a question or two before we, before we end. Um, uh, who has a question? Yes. Hey. Okay. I was uh, curious. I came a little bit late, so I hope you didn't talk about this at the very beginning, but could that third edge or whatever, could it be something related to like cyber security? And, and could you talk about cyber security a little bit? So the question is, uh, uh, can cyber security be one of the third, uh, one of the components of the third offset strategy? Cyber security is one of the important, one of the most important components of the third offset strategy. Already, that's already pretty well established, yes. Good question. Great question. Other questions? Going once. <laughs> Cybersecurity is an asymmetric warfare, really. So yes, a question. Um, I was at a Zika conference yesterday, and it was brought up about even closing the Olympics down or moving them someplace else because of the... <laughs> because of, is, is, is there a question about the Zika virus? Yeah, and the Olympics. And the, yeah. It was brought up closing it down, even. And, and, and what, what, what's the question? Thoughts on the Zika virus and the Olympics? And thoughts on, do you have any thoughts on Zika virus as a national security issue or as a security issue? I don't know any more about the Zika virus than you do. But what I read about it, it sounds like a serious problem. Yeah. Uh, other questions? Yes, right there. <coughs> Hi, um, how do you see Iranian and American relations developing going forward? So the question is, how do you see Iranian and American relationships going forward? I think the, the agreement that was made with Iran on their nuclear program is a, was a necessary but not a sufficient condition for establishing good relationships. It was certainly necessary. It, po it poises us and it poises Iran to try to work together in a more cooperative and friendly manner. So it's possible now for that to happen, and I hope it can happen. There is a lot of opposition in the United States. All you have to do is read the newspapers to understand a lot of people not only don't want that cooperative relationship, but they didn't even want the, the, the nuclear deal. There's a lot of opposition to it. Uh, there's also a, a lot of opposition in Iran to it. We read about our side of the but, but the Iran Revolutionary Guard is entirely opposed to the deal, and they want to go ahead and build nuclear weapons. They're very, very clear about that. So there's a big opposition in both countries. Who will prevail remains to be seen. One can hope that in the United States, at least, it will, would, it will move forward trying to seek a positive relation with Iran. The last time I visited, I should say I've, I've met four times with Iranian officials, the now, one and now the foreign minister and the national security advisor, talking about this problem. Just trying to see if I could, this is before we actually started negotiating, see if I could find a foothold for our negotiators on this. And I was persuaded that we could find, we could make a deal with them. Although the deal we ended up with, I was able to better, more favorable than what I thought we could get. Um, I also have visited Iran a, a number of times, most recently as a tourist, and met with a lot of Iranians. There's a, a wellspring of good feeling for Americans among Iranians. Whatever the government says or does, uh, there's a, there's a, there really is a, a basis, I think, for a, good, for a positive relationship. So I'm, I'm truly hoping we can get something going positive with Iran again. It's stupid for us to be at loggerheads with Iran. Well, Mr. Secretary, I, I got smarter this last hour. So <laughs> thank you very much uh, uh, for your time. And, uh, <laughs>